Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Chris Ray, welcome to the Center of the Universe. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little weird to say Center of the Universe with you sitting here. Um, our podcast is called Stories from the Center of the Universe, and of course you co-founded and co-owned uh, Center of the Universe Brewery, um, and as well as Origin uh, Beer Lab. Very happy to have you. Um, I've actually been trying to get you on the podcast. Uh, you didn't know that probably uh, for a while, <laughs> ma- mostly because of your Major League Baseball career, but we'll, we'll talk about that in due time. Sure. So how did you start uh, Co2 Brewery? Um, so just like a lot of folks that are entrepreneurs, um, you know, we were hobbyists first, uh, home brewed. Uh, my brother and I would uh, brew beers, and he was still down in Florida where we grew up, and I would send him beers. He'd send me beers, and uh, more of just a, a, a fun thing uh, to try out, and then... As my uh, career progressed um, and was traded out to the West Coast, um, was introduced to a lot more breweries out uh, there. Um, so this was back in 2010. Um, I was in San Francisco and then the next year in Seattle. Um, and at that time, I mean, it was leaps and bounds ahead of the East Coast in terms of uh, market saturation. And so uh, really the kind of aha moment was when I walked into a convenience store um, and went to the beer section and they probably had six different coolers of beer. And I think one half of one section was dedicated to domestic. And I was like, this is pretty impressive. I want to be a part of this. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of how uh, things started getting put in motion. Um, in 2011, when I was in Seattle, uh, we actually teamed up with a brewery out there, Fremont Brewing Company, which is uh, one of the larger ones out there now, and uh, created Hops for Heroes, which is a, uh, it's a nationwide effort where we brew a beer called Homefront IPA every year and then donate 100% of the proceeds to Soldiers Angels, which helps out uh, men and women who are both serving overseas and then their families who are here as well. So that's, awesome. that's kind of how we cut our teeth and, and getting into the industry and uh, worked on that for a year or two and then finally opened up in 2012. Why Ashland? Um, so uh, I've lived in Ashland um, ever since, oh geez, I guess 2003. Um, so I was drafted out of William & Mary and uh, my wife is from Hanover. And so we just made this area our home. And so every off season I'd come back and um, you know, playing during a season, you're playing in big cities all year long, uh, hearing traffic, uh, you know, sirens and, and, and the lot. And so I really wanted to find a place that was quiet, um, had its own kind of charm close enough to a big city if, if, you know, looking for some of those amenities. And, you know, Ashland just seemed like the, the perfect fit for it. So this is where we settled. Um, and then we were looking to open up the brewery. Um, it was very convenient being located right off of 95, um, really kind of establish our own backyard. You know, the breweries were starting to pop up in Richmond, and uh, we didn't see much of a sense of kind of joining the crowd and instead kind of putting our flag down somewhere that we could, you know, be proud of and kind of own the area, uh, for lack of a better term. And you have owned the area. Yes. Your, your business has done quite well. Yes, yeah, so, uh, nine years in, and we are still, well, now there's two craft breweries in Hanover, but Origin Beer Lab's the other one, so uh, we still claim that, uh, you know, we're, we're still holding on strong as the uh, the sole brewery in the county. Yeah, nice. Uh, I've had plenty of your beers. My favorite is uh, Pocahontas. Oh, thank you. That's, uh, it's not even close. That beer is... Uh, yeah. Is, is is our is our lifeblood really it's about 60 percent of our volume holy um, cow wow. yeah we we entered the market at a good time um and really kind of specialized in in that beer and in, in hoppy beers whereas uh legend which was here for a long time obviously still here was you know their brown ale and then when hardywood popped up they were more on the on the belgian side and so we really kind of came strong with with the first i guess the easily accessible west coast ipa um in the area and um, that kind of took hold and uh, have, hasn't looked back since. So we're, we're really proud of that brew. So talk to me about the relationship between Origin and Co2. Sure. So um, it wasn't too long after we opened Center of the Universe when we started adding more tanks and, and realized that we needed a little <clears throat> bit more proper way to pilot batch and experiment um, besides, you know, basically a glorified homebrew setup. Um, the space that we were in, um, you know, got maxed out pretty quickly and we didn't have room and, you know, being in Ashland, living in Ashland, I also wanted a place that was more of a storefront. So center of the universe is located in an industrial park. Um, so most people don't take Sunday drives uh, through <laughs> industrial parks and happen <laughs> upon the blue, uh, brewery. So it's definitely more of a, a destination location. And we wanted something that was more retail walk up. Um, and, you know, with, with myself 
being in Ashland, I, I wanted the ability to walk there myself. So uh, we waited years, and finally a spot opened up in the uh, location that we were looking for, and, and we jumped on it. It's yep. funny you say that, that the first time I found it, it was an accident. Mm -hmm. I literally, and I wasn't taking a Sunday drive to an industrial park, <laughs> but we were trying to get somewhere, and I was like, oh my gosh, there it is. I knew about it, and so it's cool. Why? Why? So at what point in your life were you just like a beer fanatic? Do you love beer? Did you say, I want to start brewing it? I mean, that seems like a interesting yeah, decision. It, it was, I was actually introduced to brewing beer um, by my old college roommate um, and Ashland resident. His name is Marshall Hubbard. And mm -hmm. uh, he came over one day and was like, hey, I, I, I learned how to do this over the summer. Let's try it. And I was like, um, all right, <laughs> I, guess, I, guess, I guess we'll give it a go. And uh, the beer wasn't great, but it was, uh, wasn't bad enough where it discouraged me, and I just it kind of got hooked on, on brewing. I think it's yeah. just the, the creative aspect of, of, you know, making a beer taste exactly the way you want it. You know, when you're just a consumer drinking the beer, you don't realize how many different ingredients and how many different varietals of each of those ingredients yeah. goes into it. And so, really, you can craft a beer to, to meet whatever flavor profile you wanted, and that's what kind of got me hooked on it. And, you know, it... I jumped into the business of it because, you know, as a, as a former um, professional athlete, you reset every year. You don't get a chance to keep building on something. You know, you go through a season, you, you work a, 180 uh, days, 162 games, and then after that last game, if you're not in the playoffs, it just goes back to zero again, and you, and you don't ever get to actually build something. And so that's when I really kind of established that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be able to have something my own where – the amount of work that I put into it, I'm going to get the results back out. And year over year, you can keep um, either growing or improving. Um, and, and that's really what kind of drove me to, to wanting to open up my own brewery. Talk, talk to us about how you make a batch of beer and how long the process takes typically. Sure. Um, well, I hate to, to be a spoiler here, but, but making a good beer is not difficult. Um, you know, really the, the most difficult part is, and this is with any manufacturing, is making the same exact beer over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when we decide that we want to either do a, do a beer to, to match a name or to, uh, um, you know, hit a flavor profile, you know, we sit down as a staff, um, you know, our brew team, we want to get them involved in everything because we want all of our staff to kind of take ownership in, in everything that we do. And so we sit down, we talk about a flavor profile, and we just start hammering out pen on paper and, um, and that's where Origin Beer Lab just kind of, uh, it, you know, it's an invaluable piece of our, of our business model because we can take that recipe over there, we can brew it. We don't distribute out of Origin, so there's nobody, you know, no distributors breathing down our necks waiting for that batch to come out. Mm. And nobody knows what we're brewing over there. So mm. if the beer turns out bad, well, we open a valve up, we dump 100 gallons of beer down the drain, which seems like a lot, but it's, a, it's not quite as much as the 2,000 gallon batches that we're doing at the other facility. So. Um, and we take it over there, and if it doesn't work out the way we want it to, then we go back to the drawing board and we tweak it. Um, and we, we tweak recipes constantly. You know, that's, that's kind of like the athlete in me. You know, I'm never going to be satisfied. We're never going to have the perfect beer. Uh, something can always change, and um, that's kind of the process, you know, and, it, and it, it's fun. You know, that's, that's what, you know, we got into this industry because it's fun. Now it's not fun all the time, and sometimes there's a pandemic and you got and you got to it's a business yeah it's yeah. a business but at the same time you know you never want to kind of lose lose sight of why you got into it in the first place and that's really what origin provides us and our and our brewers is just that ability to go out there and have fun are you spending more time at origin i wish <laughs> <laughs> i wish no i, I don't spend a, a ton of time over there in a, in a professional capacity um my office is at the main facility but i mean most weekends you'll find me there either you know, with my family or with a couple of friends, um, you know, that's the spot that I kind of really like to hang out at because, you know, that's sometimes that's the first opportunity for me to test some of these test batches is when I go there to have a beer. Do you uh, taste test every batch? Um, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, at the main facility, when we're, when we're cranking out batch after batch after batch of the same beer, um, I'm not involved in the tasting panel on that. Um, but anything that's new, um, I just like to taste it for my own personal preference it's a nice french benefit it is it is it's really cheap beer there for me which is which comes in <laughs> which comes in handy on the weekend I yeah guess. you're not spending two or three bucks per bottle there you go yeah have you gone to places like hardywood and and just to taste what they're doing to get ideas or maybe have you gone somewhere like that and said and you don't need to minute. give away you don't need to give this, away any trade secrets <laughs> this is my beer well how do they get i mean um you know it, on the weekends you typically will find me you know with our next door neighbors at, over at the caboose over there and 
you know, it, it's fun for me to try beers from all different places, yeah. you know, but you, you have to be a little bit careful. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just as there's plenty of great beer in Richmond and in, in general, there's plenty of beer that's not so great. And uh, the cost of some of these beers these days, you have to be a little bit careful. But, um, you know, I definitely explore just yeah. to kind of taste and see what's yeah. going on. Um, you know, obviously trends are not hard to find in the craft beer world. Um, it seems like as soon as somebody innovates something, it's days later before you've got, you know, a whole dozen other breweries doing the exact same thing. But, you know, I, I just like to, to drink different beer because I like beer. Yeah. 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 What's been your biggest challenge so far? Um, on the brewery as a whole, I guess the biggest challenge is it, the constant evolution of craft beer. You know, this, this industry moves so fast um, from... You know, before, if you brewed an IPA, you just brewed an IPA. And now there's West Coast, East Coast, New England, hazy, sour, fruited. I mean, there's mm. so many. And you and it's it's difficult to to really put your finger on which one is actually going to be sustainable. Um, and that that's the, one of the, the biggest challenges is, you know, picking the right one, you know. So same goes in the cider, not the cider category, but rather the, uh, the hard seltzer category. I mean, mm. you just saw a thing that came out. Uh, last week where where sam adams over projected um and their stock dropped 25 percent because wow. they they bought in too much into this into the seltzer and so that's that's one of the biggest difficulties is that we have is is catching on to a trend is one thing but making sure that you catch on the right one because um, you know beer development takes a long time um especially from a branding uh standpoint and so um, you really have to invest a lot into every new brand and so making sure that the one is still going to be there by the time you you hit market is is difficult how does a kid from florida end up at william and mary um that was the only division one school that i got any sort of scholarship offer and it was a one-tenth scholarship um, <laughs> so i you know coming out of high school i was kind of middle of the road I, you know I, I, I grew up in tampa uh, throwing 84 to 86 and you know some people would be like well it's pretty good coming out of high school but you know in that area that's average hillsborough uh, right hillsborough high school yeah, yeah. so gary sheffield dwight gooden <laughs> um oh, you wow. know, some some big names that came out of yeah. there um and you know i i'll tell you i i watched or not at that time but i listened to i think it was over 50 rounds of the draft after my senior year because we did have a player on there who uh, ended up going third round so i knew that there were scouts in attendance and so always kind of held up hope that i was going to be there and didn't but didn't let it discourage me. The, the summer after my junior year, my, my father and I kind of toured around the East Coast and just went to camps just to get in front of uh, college coaches. And um, I actually got an offer. It was in March or April of my senior year in high school um, to go to William & Mary. And at that time, I mean, I never heard of William & Mary before. I was going to say, there's no <laughs> way you'd heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, wait, are they in the SEC, ACC? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, – you know, baseball is one of those sports where it doesn't really matter where you play. They're going to find you, and, yeah. and they don't really care who you play for as long as you can play. And so everything worked out. Um, you know, I, I wish I knew the secret formula of what happened, but um, gained 10 miles an hour within a year. Um, and I was, you know, summer of, after my freshman year, throwing 95, 96 in, in the Valley That's League. Crazy. That's moving. Yeah, it was it was it was fun. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, wait, wait, wait. You, so you gained 10 miles an hour in a year. Yes. And, and you just said you don't know what the magic formula was. I, I don't. Um, you know, I, I started feeling something. I was playing Legion ball the summer after my senior year in high school, and guys were starting to miss on fastballs and kind of felt it. Uh, got to William Mary fall ball, um, hit 90 a couple times, which, again, I don't know why. Um, right. Maybe – because I ran, I didn't run a lick in high school. Because um, hey, you know, your legs matter as a pitcher. They do, they do. You know, and if and if you're doing it right, you're using pretty much everything that you can muster from all parts of your body. And I think I just kind of found my arm slot. You know, once mm -hmm. I found it, and I found that whip, and I found, um, you know, when I should be releasing it, then I could start kind of really focusing on putting the power in my legs to my arm and and kind of pushing everything. And you know, it. It worked out, and then you know uh, the, yeah. the next summer I'm I'm hitting 99 to 100 in Cape Cod, and that was it. So that's otherworldly to me. It, I mean, it was fun. Um, you know, <laughs> I basically just got up there and threw as hard as I could. <laughs> that <laughs> was awesome. my technique. Um, you know, and it, it it worked long enough where you know then I could fall back on opening up a brewery and yeah. sitting back watch baseball and drink beer instead that's you're living a good life there you go. i'm not complaining that's for yeah, sure yeah so <laughs> was your best pitch a fastball it was it was i was a fastball and then anything else that i could 
throw up there to kind of get them off the just, just to be different yeah. yeah i mean i threw a slider um which was fair um and then i threw a splitter which had its days and other times it didn't but yeah it was it was mainly fastball and i had that you know that elusive like rising yeah you know, that were hitters like oh it's rising when it's coming in like well physics says no but it must be doing something right so change no change up um no that i used a fork ball essentially oh, okay. um and like i said it when it was good it was great when it was bad it was just something that wasn't a fastball yeah could you throw it for strikes um the fork ball sometimes sometimes yeah (laughs) when they swung at it (laughs) how how fast was was a fork ball moving for you uh it was about 87 okay it was was a nice change it was it was a good change of pace and it you know it changed up their timing a little bit and that's all i was really looking for you know fortunately i was a reliever um you know for the most part a short reliever so i was coming in there facing Facing a batter one time, they didn't have to see me yeah. see him again a couple innings later. So, you know, I, I tricked him, and then that was it. <laughs> well, you led the league in saves one year, didn't you? Or you were? Um, I didn't lead the league in saves. Um, I mean, I was a closer. I was the closer in Baltimore in 2006. So okay. I I got two whole months of big league experience under my belt, and then Baltimore said, "Congratulations, now you're closing." That never so, happens. Yeah, I mean, it was the same. It was myself and, and Jonathan Papelbon. Like, we were the same kind of draft class and same progression. Um, he played for a much better team than I played <laughs> for. Um, but, um, you know, he and I, you know, knew each other in that manner. And, um, you know, it, it, was a, it was a good start. It was a good, you know, that one year I pretty much carried me for five more years. Oh, you know, it was awesome. – um, sometimes that's all it takes um, in, in professional sports for people to take flyers on you. So. You know, uh, what round were you drafted in? Uh, third round. Third round. And you did all four years at William & Mary? Uh, three. So it was after my junior year. Okay. Um, I went back to William & Mary for the uh, fall semester. Um, but then um, after that, I, I got called up. And um, yeah. the season does not play well with, with uh, school season. So that was it. So I'm 16 credits shy, but my boss is pretty lenient when it comes to to degrees and stuff like that. So I'm okay. <laughs> you could have ended up at a worse school. I can tell you that. You know, you had never heard of it. Sure. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I knew. I knew academically it was yeah. it was a solid school. And um, you know, at that time they were they were playing their conference had you know East Carolina and and U of R and had some good good teams in it. Um, and we actually won the conference my my freshman year, which was a lot of fun. So. Was at the same time Clay Meredith was at VCU, or were you a little after him? Um, I think Clay might have been the same. I was the same year as Verlander. So Verlander okay. and I um, locked horns a couple of times um, my, my junior year. Um, of course, he's a, a different beast. But uh, um, it, it was always fun to kind of to pitch against him. And Yeah, he was at ODU. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Same conference? Same conference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was it like to be an athlete at, at William & Mary? Um, I mean, probably just the same as it was to be <laughs> be a regular student, except that you were expected to. It's, to, it's to brutal to do both. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, they didn't they didn't give you any exceptions at that school. I'll tell you what, you you better go to class, even if the the coach was like, "We're not in town." They were like, "Well, you better figure out a way." Mm-hmm. And um, but it, you know, that's understandable. It's all right. You know, that's good. we had a we had a really nice facility and really nice baseball field um, out there that was only a few years old. Um, so it was a good place to play in and. Um, good coach, good teammates. I mean, there were several several players on that team that I played with that were drafted, and um, I think three of them reached the big leagues that were on my team. So, uh, not too shabby for a no. for a you know, I wouldn't even say a mid major. It was probably you know, I don't even know what you would call. Oh, yeah, got, we'll <laughs> the, let the you cold, come up with that. Yeah, we, the, we won't the, say. C, the CAA. <laughs> but be nice and say mid major. There you go. So it would be nice. How long were you in the minors? Um, I pitched in the minors uh, one month after I got drafted and then about a year and two months. So um, I was drafted in 03 and then debuted two months into the season in 05. And wow. you, were at, you went through all the steps, rookie, single A? Um, I started at uh, Aberdeen. So that's uh, right after the draft. That's where they sent all their, all their draft class. And then I played low A, high A, and then double A. I never played in triple A. So I played two months of double A. Um, they had me starting for the first first year when I was in low A and, and, and high A just to get innings and, and work on my secondary pitches. And then um, as soon as they put me into the closers role, um, back into it uh, at, at Bowie and double A, um, then that was it. So um, that was a fun first half of, of minor league baseball, too, getting back into, into closing. Um, I think I ended up – I was 19 for 19 on saves with like a .8 ERA. Wow. Um, and it was – I knew it was coming. Um, I was waiting for it. You know, you start 
watching everybody else's stats at the big league level and being like, not exactly rooting for people to do bad, but uh, <laughs> looking looking for some space to open up so that uh, you can get your chance up there. That's competitive, right? Yeah. And yeah. so then, you know, as soon as I got called up, I was setting up for B.J. Ryan. And Wow. Um, yeah. So you, how long were you an actual closer in the major leagues? So I, I closed all of 2006 and then uh, half the year in 2007. Then my year ended. Um, I had Tommy John in, in 2007, 2008, rehab, 2009. Um, back with the team, but just pretty much this bullpen guy, like, um, you know, set up seventh inning, you know, really whatever they needed. And then um, after that year, I was actually traded that off season to Texas. Um, mm-hmm. That started my West Coast swing um, okay. that way. But uh, that trade was probably the best thing that could have uh, happened yeah, to me in my down. career. So um, that was a fun year, 2010. So that question leads to my next question, which is from my son. Mm-hmm. When you were a closer, what was your walk up music? Um, so I did Sweet Dreams by Marilyn Manson. Um, that was my walk-up music in Baltimore. Uh, and then I had a couple different songs. I, I know one of them was uh, a mystical song, Here I Go, when I was in Texas. Nice. Uh, the grounds crew really appreciated that that one. Uh, they, <laughs> I would get fist bumps on the way out of the uh, bullpen and, oh, and awesome. on, onto the field. Um, but I think I don't recall if I had another uh, walkout song as a reliever. Some some teams didn't do it unless you were just yeah. a closer. Yeah, a lot of teams just do it for the closer. Yeah, I think. yeah. yeah to make it stand out and be unique. But I'm a Padres fan, so Hell's oh, Bells. Yeah, and Trevor, Trevor Hoffman. Hoffman. Mm-hmm. It's, it doesn't get any better. Trevor Hoffman is. Uh, I'll, I'll never understand how he could have such a Hall of Fame career throwing a change up in the ninth inning. Exactly, it's pretty amazing. It scared so. me every time he <laughs> do the game, but it worked most yeah. of the time. Yeah, yeah he, I mean it was, you know, an amazing pitch. So. <laughs> I mean, most of the closures you see have that one pitch. I mean, you got Rivera, you know, Cutter, and you know, Hoffman, changeup. Devastating. Yeah, you, know. you just keep throwing it over and over and over again, and guys just can't hit it. It's, <laughs> it's impressive. That's, uh, that's crazy. Yeah. So uh, before Tommy John, you were throwing 100, 101? Um, I was, you know, 97 to 99 on a consistent basis before Tommy John. And then after Tommy John, um, I think I dropped maybe a mile or an hour um, or two. Uh, what happened to me with is you know, my shoulder just never recovered. Um, I think the time off um, from not throwing, um, my shoulder was like, oh, I'll just go ahead and calcify up and get going. So, um, you know, it was it was a struggle after that. But, uh, you know, it was one of those things where I was just going to keep holding on and playing as long as I could. I was on a pretty unhealthy Advil diet <laughs> for a couple of years, um, which prevented me from drinking beer during the season. So. Mm-hmm. I'm making up for lost time now. There you so, go. Yeah. Well, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for a beer lover, especially. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was uh it was about two and a half years of wow. Um, yeah, I didn't have a, a single drink during the season um, those years just because I was already doing enough damage to myself as it was just to get out there. <laughs> wow. Uh, closing versus being a middle reliever. T- tell me about the differences mentally in um, those roles. I mean, I I always thought closing was easier. Um, you know, for me as a closer, you know, when you're going to come in, you know, you know, when it's your time, um, you know, Baltimore was a little different. Um, you know, they wore me out a good bit. Um, I think I led the league in multi inning, um, appearances as a closer. Um, basically they told me if, if we were within four runs, um, at any point during the eighth or the ninth inning that you're in. Um, and so like, that's almost every game. Yes, it was a lot of games. Um, Who was the manager? Was that Show? Uh, I went through three managers in my five-year stint in Baltimore. Um, Sam Perlazzo was one, Lee Mazzilli, and um, um, I gosh, I'm I'm blanking on the. So uh, Dave never, Trembley okay, was another. So it never one. was Show Walter. No, I never played for Show Walter. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, Mazzilli. Mazzilli was my uh, my first manager, um, and he was around for maybe a month and a half, and then. Um, they hired Sam Perlazzo, uh, who was, I think he was a third base or the bench coach at that time. Wow. But, you know, it's, it's difficult, especially if you're, if you're playing on a team that's not performing. Um, they're going, that manager is going to put you in every single time that he can because his job's on the line. You right. know? And so, um, you know, it's, it's not a matter of just trying to win games. It's, it's, you know, any hope of winning a game, and they were putting me in. And, and you were an, an investment for the team, right? All players are investments. Yeah, except they didn't have any money tied up in me. I was, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm still under, you know, my second, third year in, in, in baseball. I'm not even arbitration eligible. So I'm out there pitching 
um, getting worn out making league minimum. So wow. they, you know, they yeah. didn't have, they didn't have a problem with that. What was harder about middle relief than closing? Uh, uh, middle relief, a lot of times you're coming in with runners on. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a little added pressure. I never, I never um, liked holding runners on. Um, that wasn't part of my game. That that was uh, extremely excellent. So um, there's that component of it. Um, another one is is just having to to get up and warm up and then sit back down. Get up and warm up and sit back down. Even though you're not in a game, um, you know you're ready to go you know you're you're throwing pitches down there that are game speed and so it kind of wears you out a little bit that way um and you just you never know when you're going in you're just always on edge um you know a line drive back hits the pitcher in the knee all of a sudden the phone could ring you could be in the game you know you haven't gone through your routine yet you know and that's one thing with with the bullpen is you have to have a routine i mean you're out there for 162 games you know, you can go crazy if you don't. So you knew exactly, like, what inning are you going to open up the sunflower seeds? What inning are you going to drink the Red Bull? Um, and when you're a middle reliever, it just it throws a wrench into everything. And even even though you're warming up and ready to go in the game, you feel like you're not ready because you didn't go through all those steps that you typically take. Baseball is very uh, routine-oriented and superstitious. It is, and it, and it has to be. Um, like I said, you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy. You play 162 games in 180 days, and if, and if you don't have a set regimented routine, um, it just you're just off. <laughs> you just come lost every day to the field. So, you know, I get to the field every day between 2 and 2.30, and I don't even really – my job doesn't even start till 9.30. So it's um, – you, you just you got to know. You gotta it's know a full work day. Time. It is. It is. It's a full work day. And, I mean, that's why Major League Baseball is getting in, in quite a bit of trouble right now with with the minor leagues, um, mm-hmm. especially when you know when I was playing, what they were paying us. You know, and in that in minor leagues, we would get one day off every other month. You know, we we play every day, um, and you know, taking home seven hundred. Not even taking home, but your check was for seven hundred dollars a month. You know, you're working thirty days a month for nine to ten hours a day it's below minimum wage it is it, yes yeah it is um it's way below minimum wage yeah but and so, they had some loophole the way they describe uh, the pay right, right because yeah. we're not we're not um year-round employees and that's kind of how they they did it but they didn't pay us in the off season either <laughs> like you're just sitting there doing nothing in the off season you're not year round right right okay. so yeah. what's what's going to be new in the next year or so for kotu or origin um well, we're we're going to be starting to work on our uh, our 2022 seasonal lineup. Um, you know, there's not going to be a ton of of new stuff. I mean, you know, fortunately for us at at the main facility, we're essentially at capacity. Um, so it's mainly switching out some seasonals that we didn't think performed as well as they as they used to, um, and uh, you know, just really just kind of having some more fun introducing large events again. You know, that's one thing that we have got put on hold over this last year and a half and. You know, there's a little bit of a slinky effect there where you can't just launch them right back again. You have to kind of build them back up and, um, you know, staff turnover. We have to get things back in line again. But but really, we just want to, you know, continue making good beer. Um, we're going to be doing some some formula modifications with one of our year rounds, Chameleon IPA, um, to bring it back uh, more into the style that, that folks are concentrating on right now. Um, you know, it's a good beer as is. But, you know, again, you have to you have to put out beer that people want to drink and um but other than that you know we're just we're just going to be open and, and and ready for for folks to come out and have a good time now chameleon does that mean you actually could change this beer's taste based on the season or something like that uh so chameleon is a it's an ipa that we we change the hop profile up um all the time when we brew it and that's it's kind of one of our our teaching things where you know if there's a new experimental hop a lot of times we'll get stuff that's like the name of the hop is hbc 472 um because they haven't named them yet um and so we'll use hops like that to just create different interesting uh you know hop profiles and different tropical fruits and citruses and things of that nature that's cool very cool our timekeeper is telling us it's almost time to close but i've got two questions before we do that do you have a fun memory from being in the bullpen bullpens are typically pretty fun right yeah, bullpens are bullpens are a good time as long as you're not the youngest in the bullpen. So, you know, unfortunately for me, when I was coming up, um, we had a, a pretty, uh, you know, veteran bullpen. And so I was the candy bag man for three years in Baltimore. That's a long time. It's a long time. I'm closing out games and 
lot of the times they would make me run back out to the bullpen like after I just pitched and closed the game out to go get the candy bag <laughs> because they weren't going to take it in. Um, you were getting rookie treatment for three years. <laughs> I was. I was. Um, I mean, I, I took my fair share of candy now. Don't, don't get me wrong. I was bringing it out there for myself as well. But, yeah, it, the bullpen in general is just it's a fun group of guys that have a few screws loose. I mean, you kind of have to. Um, and it's, you know, the things that are, are done and said – out there and the games that we make up and play. I mean, those are things that I'll, that I'll never forget. And, you know, some of the things that I miss, you know, yeah, I like playing the game, but just kind of hanging out with those folks that are kind of like-minded is, is a, is a really good time. Yeah. You've lived a really cool life. Uh, it's awesome. Tell us about your family as we close. Sure. Um, so my wife, Alice, I, I met her at, at school. I actually met her the day before the first day of classes. Um, and we've been together ever since. She's, uh, she's from Hanover, and I've got two kids. Um, my daughter, uh, Jenny, is 10 years old. She is a big uh, theater, singing, uh, acting um, enthusiast, which is fun. And then my son is 8 years old, and um, he just likes to play anything that's a game. So uh, we just wrapped up our, our uh, all-star tournament, and uh, he's moving on. He wants to play some roller hockey or, you know something like that wow. so um but yeah it's a, it's a lot of fun and, and fortunately i got one on each side so i get to spend some time inside uh, you know enjoying some theater stuff and then the other one outside That's playing cool. some sports so i get where your son got his love of sports from where did your daughter get her theater uh, love from um you know I, I don't really know i mean i've, I've always enjoyed theater but uh, it's just kind of something that she fell into and and she really likes so she she does a lot of stuff at up at the hanover arts and activity center i mean she was there today for for theater camp and uh, i think she just likes to put on a show and maybe uh, the the center of attention i don't know make sure she knows where you were today <laughs> uh that, yeah state. for yeah. sure for she'd sure yeah, she, yeah she'd love that <laughs> very cool chris thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate you no you thanks for out. having me thanks for having me it's been fun awesome thank you for listening if you enjoy this episode please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.